so far in this class, we've seen how Racket's con cells easily enable the design of list-based data structures. List-like data just has this natural Russian nesting doll representation that is readily enabled by the layout of con cells. But what about other kinds of data? What about arbitrary tree-shaped data, like a binary tree or a k-ary tree or something like that? How would we represent that? Well, that's what we're going to look into today. It turns out that Racket's con cells can also be the foundations for arbitrary algebraic data types. Now, while many languages have a static type discipline that guard algebraic data, Racket instead takes kind of a dynamically typed style. And so we're going to be a lot more ad hoc about it. Instead of uh, using a static type discipline, we still need to understand how structured data can be represented in a general purpose way. And we also need to understand the ramifications of how that data will flow through our program and the different kinds of constructs that can manipulate it in different sorts of representations. In this lecture, we're going to talk about how Racket's S expressions can be used to build arbitrarily nested data, not just lists. We want you to leave this lecture having a good idea of how the computer represents linked data and Racket under the hood. Next week, we'll talk more about how we can use pattern matching to systematically perform computation over data built using this kind of approach. In general, we'll build data structures in Racket using what is called S expressions, or symbolic expressions. S expressions are generalizations of lists to enable arbitrary amounts of nesting. So let's look at this S expression right here. We've got this is an S expression. It's got four different components. The first is the symbol this. The second is a sub-expression, which is a sublist containing is an. The third is the symbol s. And the fourth is, again, the symbol expression. Now, under the hood, the computer represents all of these things as linked structures and scatters them throughout RAM, connecting them up in a way that we'll talk about in a few seconds. The computer represents these as linked structures, placing each different part of the S expression in a different location in RAM and linking them up using pointers. We won't have to understand the implementation at all today, but we'll give some intuition about how it works. Now, Racket also has structural types. These are defined via the keyword struct, and they do aid robustness. There are lots of niceties enabled by structured types. However, in this course at least, we're going to prefer the agility of what are called tagged S expressions. This is going to allow us to build up data in a very ad hoc style. We'll start to show this technique in the next few lectures. Racket also has an elaborate object orientation system that enables all sorts of cool things. We're not going to talk about it too much in this course, but it is very useful, for example, if you're interacting with a very object-like interface, like a GUI, for example, a traditional GUI library, something like that. If you're interested in learning about the Racket object system, I'd love to talk to you about it offline, and I'll absolutely talk about the connection between functions and objects throughout the course. So we remember the function cons builds a con cell. Cons accepts two arguments, an x and y coordinate, or a left and right element of the cons cell. So for example, cons of 0, 1 builds a cons cell where the car of the cons cell is the number 0, and the cutter of the cons cell is the number 1. Now, at runtime, each cons cell actually represents an address in memory that contains two references to the car and to the cutter. So in this example here, I've got this con cell, then pointing at zero for the car and one for the cutter, and the entire con cell is located at this address in memory. This is a real representative address that you might see, for example, on a 64-bit operating system. But from the perspective of Racket, you'll never actually be able to understand where this is at because it's at a lower abstraction level. So this is not something you need to know for your day-to-day -day Racket usage, but I find it very important to understand under the hood at runtime, there is some layout happening, and this is how it's actually physically stored in the machine. Now, in fact, I should say that pretty much everything in Racket is stored at some place in memory. Uh, numbers are also stored at memory location. So for example, this console here, 
that is the cons pair of zero and one, the representation of zero, and of course also the representation of one, also lie at some other memory address. So for example, in this example right here, I've got the car is a reference to some element stored at some location, for example, that ends in 1564, some large hex number. Now, because numbers are stored at memory locations and then referenced, rather than just held immediately, we're going to say that numbers are a boxed type in Racket. And this is similar to many other managed, what are called managed languages like Java, perhaps a little bit unlike languages like C and C++ and Rust, which give you a lot more fine-grained control over where things are represented in memory. That's one trade-off that we're making in Racket. All of this memory representation stuff, it's at a lower level sort of abstraction layer than we can really touch in Racket. In fact, Racket doesn't expose the fact that these things are represented in memory at all. From our perspective as a Racket programmer, they could be stored on some piece of paper in a notebook somewhere, and the computer could be doing something like paying someone on AW or paying someone on you know, Mechanical Turk to go physically fetch the piece of paper and come back and give it to us. All right, so, but it is important to, I think, understand that these things are actually being held somewhere. And to really hammer it home, every racket variable actually stores its value in some box or memory location. So we'll use the term box to just represent the fact that there is some memory location corresponding to a value. So let's look at how this piece of code executes. I've defining x as 23. And then I do a display len of x, and then I set bang x to be 24, and then I display x again. Now, if x is immutable, I should expect that the two display lens will return the same thing, because of course, x is only declared once. How could it ever change? But let's see what happens. Now, the first time I get to the display len, I'm going to be printing out 23, but I'm going to encounter set bang. Now setBang takes a variable and a thing to update that variable to. And setBang mutably writes the box in memory corresponding to that variable and updates it so that now here, x becomes 24. x's value changes. Now, Racket also has what are called vectors. Vectors are very similar to arrays in C and C++ type languages. They're mutable, contiguously accessed sequences, and they give us constant time indexing and updating. And this can be very crucial for the implementation of some algorithms, actually. Although we won't be doing too much with that in this class, it is important to know that they exist. Now, I do want to give an important caveat, which is that even though I've talked about set bang and vector set bang and other things like that, you pretty much can't use it in this class, at least not yet, and it's really not going to be that useful to use it. If you try to use setBang and hash setBang and vector setBang, my experience teaching this class a few times is that you're going to run into way too much trouble, way more trouble than it's worth to use setBang to begin with. And so we, the instructors, are kindly going to request that you avoid using setBang in code that you turn into us. I'll say I've had a ton of experiences with students who they just tried to implement something using setBang because, you know, they were used to programming imperatively and that's just what made sense to them. But unfortunately, it has some really crummy ramifications because of the mutability. A lot of the things that we're going to be doing in CIS 352, they just break when you use setBang. One of the most obvious ones is that once we use setBang, none of our textual reduction semantic stuff works out very nicely because when a single variable would be referenced, if we substitute it, we're substituting it kind of once and forever. If the variable is allowed to change, then that substitution doesn't really work out. We have to do something a little bit different. We'll kind of see what that is later. And in fact, towards the end of the class, we will actually build a model of setBang and write some interpreters for languages that use setBang, which is going to be pretty cool. I really look forward to that. But at least until that point, please hold off from using setBang. I really think it's easier if you avoid it. Now, con cells and pairs, they enable us to build big linked lists of data of arbitrary size by doing this nesting thing that we talked about in the past few lectures. So I've got this list right here. 
cons one, cons zero, empty list. We can kind of think about it from the right to the left side as being starting with the empty list and then cons on to that is zero. So then we've got zero, its coder is the empty list. That's the list of zero. Then cons one with the coder is that list. So we've got one, cons zero, cons empty list. And this is how Racket actually represents lists in memory. So each of these different con cells is laid out at a physical memory location. The empty list itself is laid out at a physical memory location. Now also note that in Racket, the following two things are equivalent. So if I write cons two, cons one, cons zero, list, that's the same as just writing out this literal list 210 using the quote syntax. A few lectures from now, we'll talk about how we can use quasi quote to build up what is called quoted data. But if you use this quote symbol, it's going to build up lists by default, which are just the same thing as the sets of con cells. But I also want to point out you need to be really careful. If you end up using a list, but you don't end it in the empty list, you get what's called an improper list. So if you have, for example, something that is fairly list-like, but it's being held back from being a list because there's no cons uh, with the empty list at the end, you're going to get something printed in Racket that is printed with using this representation. If you see this, it means you've made an improper list. This is actually the way that Racket prints a con cell. So this is saying this is a con cell whose left element is the list to, uh, or the uh, two one, so two cons of two and one, and then the right is just the element zero. And the dot indicates a con cell of some left and right element. Now let's talk about how Racket actually represents these and draw what I'm going to call cons diagrams. This is a technique that you should really get into the habit of for this class because when you start getting confused about how data is represented, one of the first things that I'm going to request you do is actually get out a sheet of paper and draw out physically how that data is represented. So let's go back to this initial example that we had a few slides ago where we had this and then this nested is an and then s expression. How could we represent that as a what I'm going to call cons diagram? We're actually going to draw it like this. We're going to see we've got this kind of top level list that consists of four elements. So we've got this kind of four element list here. The first element of that list is the symbol this. The second element of that list is actually a reference to a sublist. And this is precisely what's going to enable to us to build up arbitrary tree-shaped data. The combination of being able to nest data inside of other lists and recursion will allow us to do things like, for example, process and build binary trees. All right. So then note the third element of this list is then the symbol S. And the fourth element of this list is just the symbol expression. And we can see here, for example, this sublist. I'll just push on this again. Note that this second element here is then a link to this sublist here. There's nothing immediately in the second element. Its car is pointing at this sublist right here. So if we were to actually draw out, this is the entire cons diagram. This whole thing right here is the cons diagram for this list or S expression right here. So this is a compound S expression, and this is the cons diagram for this S expression. All right, so to wrap this up, let's draw cons diagrams for the following two things. So I've got the cons of zero, cons of three, four. Then I'm going to ask, is that a list? If not, what is it? And then the other one, cons zero, cons three, cons four, and then empty list. What about this one? All right, so the first one, cons zero, cons three, four. Let's draw a cons diagram for that. Okay, so we know we've got a con cell, so we're gonna draw a con cell right here. The left side, the car side of the con cell is zero. The right side, the cutter of the con cell is another con cell. So what is its car? Well, that's three. And then what is its cutter? Well, it's four. Now, this is not a list. It's not a list because it doesn't end in the empty list. So instead, we would conventionally call this an improper list in Racket. All right, and actually, if I take this and I copy this uh, 
I copy this into Dr. Racket over here. And I can see I get this con cell that's being printed as the left side is con zero, cons three. The right side is four. And again, Racket is printing this as an improper list. It's printing it as a cons. Left side of the dot is the car of the cons. The right side of the, con, uh, the dot is the coder of the cons. Let's say we want to define binary trees in Racket. So how do we define binary trees? Well, what do binary trees look like? Let's say we're going to have two types of nodes. First, we're going to have leaves. We're going to represent that like this. We're going to say a leaf is this tagged S expression where the first element is just the symbol leaf. And then the second element is the value of that leaf. So let's say it's something like 42. And then let's say the second type of node is going to be node of some value. So maybe 13 and then some other node over here. So maybe this is something like leaf of, uh, let's say negative two. And then the right side is going to be a leaf as well. So let's say something like leaf of 42. All right. So how can I represent a function in Racket that will check whether something is a binary tree? Well, I can write this predicate binary tree, huh? T. And I can use cond to do this. So I can say cond, and this is going to be and car of T is going to be equal to equal, huh? Car of T is going to equal tick leaf. And then let's say, um, integer, huh? So integer, huh? Of the cutter. So we're going to say that the, nope, it can't be the cutter. It has to be the car of the cutter, right? Because if I've got leaf of 42, the second element here is the car of the cutter. So it's actually the second. So I want to say actually integer, huh? second t and instead of using car let's use first car is not a really helpful name we should probably use first from now on it makes a lot more sense when we actually read the code doesn't it so let's say um, if the first element is equal to t and the second element is uh, some integer and then let's also maybe say length equal huh length of uh, t is two. So if all these things are true, then it's a then it's a leaf. Then it's a leaf, and we're going to return true. Otherwise, the length is going to be what? It's going to be two, three, four. So it needs to be four, and then this first element has to be an integer. The second one has to be some other binary tree. And the third one has to be some other binary tree here. So let's say equal, huh? Length t is going to be four. And then we're going to say equal, huh? First t is going to be node. And then we're going to say binary tree, huh? Third, uh, let's see. So second, huh? What needs to be true of second? needs to be integer, huh? So integer, huh? Second of T. And then the third one has to be a binary tree. So third of T needs to satisfy binary tree, huh? And then so does the fourth. Binary tree, huh? Fourth of T. And if that's the case, then it's a node. Now, otherwise, if it's any other thing than one of these shapes, we're going to say it's not a tree or not a binary tree. So we're going to say else 
false. Not a binary tree. And note, this is just our definition, all right? There's no word from on high telling us that it has to be defined this way. We're just choosing to set it up this way. All right, so we could set it up some other way. We could represent these things a little bit differently, but this is just how we're gonna represent it in this, in this example. All right, so that's how we write a predicate to check whether a binary tree or whether some piece of data is a binary tree. And so that's good, pretty much going to wrap up our coverage or introduction to con cells and how we draw them. You should remember how to do these and continue to practice them on your own. But I'd also like to give you an exercise to dig into on your own if you'd like. So just as we've defined binary trees here, now I'd like to think about how could you define a function sorted tree, huh, that accepts binary trees and tells you whether they're sorted. Now we're going to say a binary tree is sorted when any node in the tree is greater than everything on the left and less than everything on the right. So in particular, this node here or is sorted because negative two is less than 13, 42 is greater than 13. This one is not sorted because 20 is on the left side, it's greater than 13, so it should be on the right side. All right, similarly, We've got another recursive instance of a binary tree as the left sub node of this parent node 13 right here. This node is sorted though, because we go 13, its left side is zero, its left side is negative five, negative five is less than zero, but then zero's right side is 10. 10 is between zero and 13, so this one's all good. And the right side of this one is a leaf of 42. But this one is not sorted because this number 15 right here is greater than 13. All right, so now I'd like you to think on your own. How could you code this up? How could you implement this version of sorted tree based on what we just did up there? All right, so think about that and be prepared for lecture.